section one of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli local descriptions nothing is more idle and what is less to be forgiven in a writer more tedious than minute and lengthened descriptions of localities where it is very doubtful whether the writers themselves had formed any tolerable notion of the place they describe it is certain their readers never can these descriptive passages in which writers of imagination so frequently indulge are usually a glittering confusion of unconnected things circumstances recollected from others or observed by themselves at different times the finest are thrust in together if a scene from nature it is possible that all the seasons of the year may be jumbled together or if a castle or an apartment its magnitude or its minuteness may equally bewilder yet we find even in works of celebrity whole pages of these general or these particular descriptive sketches which leave nothing behind but noun substantives propped up by random epithets the old writers were quite delighted to fill up their voluminous pages with what was a great saving of sense and thinking in the alaric of scudery sixteen pages containing nearly five hundred verses describe a palace commencing at the facade and at length finishing with the garden but his description we may say was much better described by boileau whose good taste felt the absurdity of this abondance sterile in overloading a work with useless details un auteur quelquefois trop plein de son objet jamais sans l'épuisé n'abandonne un sujet s'il rencontre un palais à mont dépeint la face il me promène après de terrasse en terrasse ici s'offre en perron la règne en corridor la ses balcons en ferme en un balustre d'or il campe les plafonds les rangs et les ovales je sens vingt fouillés pour en trouver la fin et je me sauve à peine au travers du jardin and then he adds so excellent a canon of criticism that we must not neglect it tout ce qu'on dit de trop est fade et rebutant l'esprit rassasié le rejette à l'instant qui ne sait se bonner ne sut jamais écrire we have a memorable instance of the inefficiency of local descriptions and a very remarkable one by a writer of fine genius composing with an extreme fondness of his subject and curiously anxious to send down to posterity the most elaborate display of his own villa this was the laurentinum of pliny we cannot read his letter to gallus which the english reader may in melmoth's elegant version without somewhat participating in the delight of the writer in many of its details but we cannot with the writer form the slightest conception of his villa while he is leading us over from apartment to apartment and pointing to us the opposite wing with a beyond this and a not far from thence and to this apartment another of the same sort etc yet still as we were in great want of a correct knowledge of a roman villa and as this must be the most so possible architects have frequently studied and the learned translated with extraordinary care pliny's description of his laurentinum it became so favoured an object that eminent architects have attempted to raise up this edifice once more by giving its plan and elevation and this extraordinary fact is the result that not one of them but has given a representation different from the other montfaucon a more faithful antiquary in his close translation of the description of this villa in comparing it with Philibion's plan of the villa itself observes that the architect accommodated his edifice to his translation but that their notions are not the same unquestionably he adds if ten skilful translators were to perform their task separately there would not be one who agreed with another 
if then on this subject of local descriptions we find that it is impossible to convey exact notions of a real existing scene what must we think of those which in truth describe scenes which have no other existence than the confused makings up of an author's invention where the more he details the more he confuses and where the more particular he wishes to be the more indistinct the whole appears local descriptions after a few striking circumstances have been selected admit of no further detail it is not their length but their happiness which enters into our comprehension the imagination can only take in and keep together a very few parts of a picture the pen must not intrude on the province of the pencil any more than the pencil must attempt to perform what cannot in any shape be submitted to the eye though fully to the mind the great art perhaps of local description is rather a general than a particular view the details must be left to the imagination it is suggestion rather than description there is an old italian sonnet of this kind which i have often read with delight and though i may not communicate the same pleasure to the reader yet the story of the writer is most interesting and the lady for such she was has the highest claim to be ranked like the lady of evelyn among literary wives francesca turina buffalini di citta di castello of noble extraction and devoted to literature had a collection of her poems published in sixteen twenty eight she frequently interspersed little domestic incidents of her female friend her husband her son her grandchildren and in one of these sonnets she has delineated her palace of san gustino whose localities she appears to have enjoyed with intense delight in the company of her lord whom she tenderly associates with the scene there is a freshness and simplicity in the description which will perhaps convey a clearer notion of the spot than even pliny could do in the voluminous description of his villa she tells us what she found when brought to the house of her husband Ampie, sala Ampie, logie ampio cortila e stanza ornate con gentil pittura trovai gigiu gende e nobili scultura di marmo fatta da scalpel non viglia noble giardin con un perpetuo aprila di varige fior di frutti e di verdura ambre so avi Aque a temprar la sura e strada di belta non dissimile e non men forte est il che per fortezza ha il pante e fianci e lo circonda intorno faso profundo e di real larghezza chi fe col mio signore dolce soggiorno con sante amor con somma contentezza ande ne benedico il mese el i giorno wide halls wide galleries and an ample court chambers adorned by pictures soothing charm i found together blended noble sculpture in marble polished by no chisel vile a noble garden where a lasting april all various flowers and fruits and verdure showers soft shades and waters tempering the hot air and undulating paths in equal beauty nor less the castle glory stands in force and bridged and flanked and round its circuit winds the deepened moat showing a regal size here with my lord i cast my sweet sojourn with holy love and with supreme content and hence i bless the month and bless the day end of section one section two of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli masks 
it sometimes happens in the history of national amusements that a name survives while the thing itself is forgotten this has been remarkably the case with our court masks respecting which our most eminent writers long ventured on so many false opinions with a perfect ignorance of the nature of these compositions which combined all that was exquisite in the imitative arts of poetry painting music song dancing and machinery at a period when our public theatre was in its rude infancy convinced of the miserable state of our represented drama and not then possessing that more curious knowledge of their domestic history which we delight to explore they were led into erroneous notions of one of the most gorgeous the most fascinating and the most poetical of dramatic amusements our present theatrical exhibitions are indeed on a scale to which the twopenny audiences of the barn playhouses of shakespeare could never have strained their sight and our picturesque and learned costume with the brilliant changes of our scenery would have maddened the property men and the tire women of the globe or the red bull Footnote sir philip sidney in his defence of poesy fifteen ninety five alludes to the custom of writing the supposed locality of each scene over the stage and asks what child is there that coming to a play and seeing thebes written in great letters on an old door doth believe that it is thebes as late as the production of davenant's siege of rhodes circa sixteen fifty six this custom was continued and is thus described in the printed edition of the play in the middle of the frieze was a compartment wherein was written roads in many instances the spectator was left to infer the locality of the scene from the dialogue now says sidney you shall have three ladies walk to gather flowers and then we must believe the stage to be a garden by and by we hear news of shipwreck in the same place then we are to blame if we accept it not for a rock in middleton's chaste maid sixteen thirty when the scene changes to a bedroom a bed is thrust out upon the stage all wit's wife in it which simple process was effected by pushing it through the curtains that hung across the entrance to the stage which at that time projected into the pit End of footnote shakespeare himself never beheld the true magical illusions of his own dramas with enter the red coat and exit hat and cloak helped out with painted cloths or as a bard of charles the second's time chance look back and see the strange vicissitudes of poetry your aged fathers came to plays for wit and sat knee-deep in nutshells in the pit but while the public theatre continued long in this contracted state without scenes without dresses without an orchestra the court displayed scenical and dramatic exhibitions with such costly magnificence such inventive fancy and such miraculous art that we may doubt if the combined genius of ben jonson indigo jones and laws or pharaoh bosco at an era most favourable to the arts of imagination has been equal by the modern spectacle of the opera but this circumstance had entirely escaped the knowledge of our critics the critic of a mask must not only have read it but he must also have heard and have viewed it the only witnesses in this case are those letter writers of the day who were then accustomed to communicate such domestic intelligence to their absent friends from such ample correspondence i have often drawn some curious and sometimes important information it is amusing to notice the opinions of some great critics how from an original misstatement they have drawn an illegitimate opinion and how one inherits from the other the error which he propagates warburton said on masks that shakespeare was an enemy to these fooleries as appears by his writing none this opinion was among the many which that singular critic threw out as they arose at the moment for warburton forgot that shakespeare characteristically introduces one in the tempest's most fanciful scene footnote the play of pyramus and thisbe performed by the clowns in shakespeare's midsummer night's dream is certainly constructed in burlesque of characters in court masks which sometimes were as difficult to be made comprehensible to an audience as the clowns of athens found wall and moonshine to be End of footnote 
granger who had not much time to study the manners of the age whose personages he was so well acquainted with in a note on milton's mask said that these compositions were trifling and perplexed allegories the persons of which are fantastical to the last degree ben jonson in his mask of christmas has introduced minced pie and baby cake who act their parts in the drama footnote it is due to a great poet like ben jonson that without troubling the reader to turn to his works we should give his own description of these characters to show that they were not the perplexed allegories they are asserted to be by granger nor inappropriate to the mask of christmas for which they were designed minced pie was habited like a fine cook's wife dressed neat her man carrying a pie dish and spoon baby cake was dressed like a boy in a fine long coat biggin bib muckander or handkerchief and a little dagger his usher bearing a great cake with a bean and a peas the latter being indicative of those generally inserted in a christmas cake which when cut into slices and distributed indicated by the presence of the bean the person who should be king the slice with the pea doing the same for the queen neither of these characters speak but make part of the show to be described by father christmas johnson's inventive talent was never more conspicuous than in the concoction of court masks End of footnote but the most wretched performances of this kind could please by the help of music machinery and dancing granger blunders describing by two farcical characters a species of composition of which farce was not the characteristic such personages as he notices would enter into the anti-mask which was a humorous parody of the more solemn mask and sometimes relieved it malone whose fancy was not vivid condemns masks and the age of masks in which he says echoing granger's epithet the wretched taste of the times found amusement and lastly comes mr todd whom the splendid fragment of the arcades and the entire mask which we have by heart could not warm while his neutralizing criticism fixes him at the freezing point of the thermometer this dramatic entertainment performed not without prodigious expense in machinery and decoration to which humour we certainly owe the entertainment of arcades and the inimitable mask of comus comus however is only a fine dramatic poem retaining scarcely any features of the mask the only modern critic who had written with some research on this departed elegance of the english drama was wharton whose fancy responded to the fascination of the fairy-like magnificence and lyrical spirit of the mask wharton had the taste to give a specimen from the inner temple mask by william brown the pastoral poet whose address to sleep he observed reminds us of some favourite touches in milton's comus to which it perhaps gave birth yet even wharton was deficient in that sort of research which only can discover the true nature of these singular dramas such was the state in which some years ago i found all our knowledge of this once favourite amusement of our court our nobility and our learned bodies of the four ends of court some extensive researches pursued among contemporary manuscripts cast a new light over this obscure child of fancy and magnificence i could not think lightly of what ben jonson has called the eloquence of masks entertainments on which from three to five thousand pounds were expended and on more public occasions ten and twenty thousand to the aid of the poetry composed by the finest poets came the most skilful musicians and the most elaborate machinists ben jonson and inigo jones footnote the first employment of these two great men was upon the mask of blackness performed at whitehall on twelfth night sixteen o three and which cost nearly ten thousand pounds of our present money End of footnote and laws blended into one piece their respective genius and lord bacon and whitelock and selden who sat in committees for the last grand mask presented to charles i invented the devices composed the procession of the maskers and the anti-maskers while one took the care of the dancing or the brawlers and whitelock the music the sage whitelock 
who has chronicled his self-complacency on this occasion by claiming the invention of a coranto which for thirty years afterwards was the delight of the nation and was blessed by the name of whitelock's coranto and which was always called for two or three times over whenever that great statesman came to see a play Footnote the music of whitelock's coranto is preserved in hawkins history of music might it be restored for the ladies as a waltz End of footnote. so much personal honour was considered to be involved in the conduct of a mask that even this committee of illustrious men was on the point of being broken up by too serious a discussion concerning precedence and the mask had nearly not taken place till they hit on the expedient of throwing dice to decide on their rank in the procession on this jealousy of honour in the composition of a mask i discovered what hitherto had escaped the knowledge although not the curiosity of literary inquirers the occasion of the memorable enmity between ben jonson and inigo jones who had hitherto acted together with brotherly affection a circumstance says gifford to whom i communicated it not a little important in the history of our calumniated poet the trivial cause but not so in its consequences was the poet prefixing his own name before that of the architect on the title-page of a mask which hitherto had only been annexed footnote this was claridia a mask performed by the queen and her ladies at court on shrovetide sixteen thirty upon the title-page of which is printed the inventors ben jonson inigo jones jonson was by reason of the influence of inigo deprived of employ at court ever after supplanted by other poets named by the architect and among them haywood shirley and devenant in the footnote so jealous was the great architect of his part of the mask and so predominant his power and name at court that he considered his rights invaded by the inferior claims of the poet johnson has poured out the whole bitterness of his soul in two short satires still more unfortunately for the subject of these satires they provoked inigo to sharpen his pen on rhyme but it is edgeless and the blunt composition still lies in its manuscript state while these researches had engaged my attention appeared gifford's memoirs of ben jonson the characteristics of masks are there for the first time elaborately opened with the clear and penetrating spirit of that ablest of our dramatic critics i feel it like presumption to add to what has received the finishing hand of a master but his jewel is locked up in a chest which i fear is too rarely opened and he will allow me to borrow something from its splendour the mask as it attained its highest degree of excellence admitted of dialogue singing and dancing these were not independent of one another but combined by the introduction of some ingenious fable into an harmonious whole when the plan was formed the aid of the sister arts was called in for the essence of the mask was pomp and glory movable scenery of the most costly and splendid kind was lavished on the mask the most celebrated masters were employed on the songs and dances and all that the kingdom afforded of vocal and instrumental excellence was employed to embellish the exhibition Footnote. george chapman's memorable mask performed at whitehall sixteen thirty by the gentlemen of the middle temple in lincoln's inn cost the latter society nearly two thousand pounds for their share of the expenses End of footnote. thus magnificently constructed the mask was not committed to ordinary performers it was composed as lord bacon says for princes and by princes it was played footnote ben jonson records the names of the noble ladies and gentlemen who enacted his inventions at court End of footnote of these masks the skill with which their ornaments were designed and the inexpressible grace with which they were executed appear to have left a vivid impression on the mind of johnson his genius awakes at once and all his faculties attuned to sprightliness and pleasure he makes his appearance like his own delight accompanied with grace love harmony revel sport and laughter in curious knot and mazes so the spring at first was taught to go and zephyr when he came to woo his flora had his motions too 
footnote the figures and actions of dancers in masks were called motions end of footnote as thus did venus learn to lead the idalian brawls and so to tread as if the wind not she did walk nor pressed a flower nor bowed a stalk but in what says gifford was the taste of the times wretched in poetry painting architecture they have not since been equalled and it ill becomes us to arraign the taste of a period which possessed a cluster of writers of whom the meanest would now be esteemed a prodigy malone did not live to read this denouncement of his objection to these masks as bungling shows and which warburton treats as fooleries granger as wretched performances while mr todd regards them merely as the humour of the times masks were often the private theatricals of the families of our nobility performed by the ladies and gentlemen at their seats and were splendidly got up on certain occasions such as the celebration of a nuptial or in compliment to some great visitor the mask of comus was composed by milton to celebrate the creation of charles i as prince of wales a scene in this mask presented both the castle and the town of ludlow which proves that although our small public theatres had not yet displayed any of the cynical illusions which long afterwards davenant introduced these cynical effects existed in great perfection in the masks the minute descriptions introduced by thomas campion in his memorable mask as it is called will convince us that the scenery must have been exquisite and fanciful and that the poet was always a watchful and anxious partner with the machinist with whom sometimes however he had a quarrel the subject of this very rare mask was the night and the hours it would be tedious to describe the first scene with the fondness with which the poet has dwelt on it it was a double valley one side with dark clouds hanging before it on the other a green vale with trees and nine golden ones of fifteen feet high from which grove towards the state or the seat of the king was a broad descent to the dancing-place the bower of flora was on the right the house of night on the left between them a hill hanging like a cliff over the grove the bower of flora was spacious garnished with flowers and flowery branches with lights among them the house of night ample and stately with black columns studded with golden stars within nothing but clouds and twinkling stars while about it were placed on wire artificial bats and owls continually moving as soon as the king entered the great hall the hote boys out of the wood on the top of the hill entertained the time till flora and zephyr were seen busily gathering flowers from the bower throwing them into baskets which two sylvans held attired in changeable taffeta the song is light as their fingers but the burden is charming now hath flora robbed her bowers to befriend this place with flowers strow about strow about divers divers flowers affect for some private dear respect strow about strow about but he's none of flora's friend that will not the rose commend strow about strow about i cannot quit this mask of which collectors know the rarity without preserving one of those doric delicacies of which perhaps we have outlived the taste it is a playful dialogue between a sylvan and an hour while night appears in her house with her long black hair spangled with gold amidst her hours their faces black and each bearing a lighted black torch sylvan tell me gentle hour of night wherein dost thou most delight hour not in sleep sylvan wherein then hour in the frolic view of men sylvan lovest thou music hour oh tis sweet sylvan what's dancing hour e'en the mirth of feet sylvan joy you in fairies and in elves hour we are of that sort ourselves but sylvan say why do you love only to frequent the grove sylvan life is fullest of content when delight is innocent our pleasure must vary not be long come then let's close and end the song 
that the movable scenery of these masks formed as perfect a cynical illusion as any that our own age with all its perfection of decoration has attained to will not be denied by those who have read the few masks which have been printed they usually contrived a double division of the scene one part was for some time concealed from the spectator which produced surprise and variety thus in the lord's mask at the marriage of the palatine the scene was divided into two parts from the roof to the floor the lower part being first discovered there appeared a wood in perspective the innermost part being of relieve or whole round the rest painted on the left a cave and on the right a thicket from which issued orpheus at the back part of the scene at the sudden fall of a curtain the upper part broke on the spectators a heaven of clouds of all hues the stars suddenly vanished the clouds dispersed an element of artificial fire played about the house of prometheus a bright and transparent cloud reaching from the heavens to the earth whence the eight maskers descending with the music of a full song and at the end of their descent the cloud broke in twain and one part of it as with a wind was blown athwart the scene while this cloud was vanishing the wood being the under part of the scene was insensibly changing a perspective view opened with porticos on each side and female statues of silver accompanied with ornaments of architecture filling the end of the house of prometheus and seemed all of goldsmith's work the women of prometheus descended from their niches till the anger of jupiter turned them again into statues it is evident too that the size of the proscenium or stage accorded with the magnificence of the scene for i find choruses described and changeable conveyances of the song in manner of an echo performed by more than forty different voices and instruments in various parts of the scene the architectural decorations were the pride of inigo jones such could not be trivial i suppose says the writer of this mask few have ever seen more neat artifice than master inigo jones showed in contriving their motion who as all the rest of the workmanship which belonged to the whole invention showed extraordinary industry and skill which if it be not as lively expressed in writing as it appeared in view robbed not him of his due but lay the blame on my want of right apprehending his instruction for the adoring of his art whether this strong expression should be only adorning does not appear in any errata but the feeling of admiration was fervent among the spectators of that day who were at least as much astonished as they were delighted ben jonson's prose descriptions of scenes in his own exquisite masks as gifford observes are singularly bold and beautiful in a letter which i discovered the writer of which had been present at one of these masks and which gifford has preserved the reader may see the great poet anxiously united with inigo jones in working the machinery johnson before a sacrifice could be performed turned the globe of the earth standing behind the altar in this globe the sea was express heightened with silver waves which stood or rather hung for no axle was seen to support it and turning softly discovered the first mask footnote see giffords johnson volume seven page seventy eight this performance was in the mask of hymen enacted at court in sixteen o five on the occasion of the marriage of the earl of essex to the daughter of the earl of suffolk End of footnote, etc this turning softly producing a very magical effect the great poet would trust to no other hand but his own it seems however that as no mask writer equalled johnson so no machinist rivalled inigo jones i have sometimes caught a groan from some unfortunate poet whose beautiful fancies were spoilt by the bungling machinist one says the order of this scene was carefully and ingeniously disposed and as happily put in act for the motions by the king's master carpenter but he adds the painters i must needs say not to belie them lent small colour to any to attribute much of the spirit of these things to their pencil campion in one of his masks describing where the trees were gently to sink etc by an engine placed under the stage and in sinking were to open and the maskers appear out uh, at their tops etc adds this vindictive marginal note either by the simplicity negligence or conspiracy of the painter the passing away of the trees was somewhat hazarded 
though the same day they had been shown with much admiration and were left together to the same night that is they were worked right at the rehearsal and failed in the representation which must have perplexed the nine maskers on the tops of these nine trees but such accidents were only vexations crossing the fancies of the poet they did not essentially injure the magnificence the pomp and the fairy world opened to the spectators so little was the character of these masks known that all our critics seemed to have fallen into repeated blunders and used the masks as campion suspected his painters to have done either by simplicity negligence or conspiracy heard a cold systematic critic thought he might safely prefer the mask in the tempest as putting to shame all the masks of johnson not only in its construction but in the splendour of its show which adds gifford was danced and sung by the ordinary performers to a couple of fiddles perhaps in the balcony of the stage such is the fate of criticism without knowledge and now to close our masks let me apply the forcible style of ben jonson himself the glory of all these solemnities had perished like a blaze and gone out in the beholder's eyes so short-lived are the bodies of all things in comparison of their souls but no splendour ultimately ruined these works they ended in gaudy dresses and expensive machinery but poetry was not associated with them the youthful days of louis fourteen raised them to a height of costly luxuriance to sink them ever after in oblivion End of footnote. End of section two. section three of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli of de maiso and the secret history of anthony collins's manuscripts de maiso was an active literary man of his day whose connections with bayle st evremont locke and toulon and his name being set off by an f r s have occasioned the dictionary biographers to place him prominently among their um illustra of his private history nothing seems known having something important to communicate respecting one of his friends a far greater character with whose fate he stands connected even de maiso becomes an object of our inquiry he was one of those french refugees whom political madness or despair of intolerance had driven to our shores the proscription of louis the fourteen which supplied us with our skilful workers in silk also produced a race of the unemployed who proved not to be as exquisite in the handicraft of book-making such were matteau lacoste ozel durand and others our arthur had come over in that tender state of youth just in time to become half an englishman and he was so ambidextrous in the languages of the two great literary nations of europe that whenever he took up his pen it is evident by his manuscripts which i have examined that it was mere accident which determined him to write in french or in english composing without genius or even taste without vivacity or force the simplicity and fluency of his style were sufficient for the purposes of a ready dealer in all the minutia literaria literary anecdotes curious quotations notices of obscure books and all that superlex which must enter into the history of literature without forming a history these little things which did so well of themselves without any connection with anything else became trivial when they assumed the form of voluminous minuteness and des maisons at length imagined that nothing but anecdotes were necessary to compose the lives of men of genius with this sort of talent he produced a copious life of bayle in which he told everything he possibly could and nothing can be more tedious and more curious for though it be a grievous fault to omit nothing and marks the writer to be deficient in the development of character and that sympathy which throws inspiration over the vivifying page of biography yet to admit everything has this merit that we are sure to find what we want 
warburton poignantly describes our de maiso in one of those letters to dr birch which he wrote in the fervid age of study and with the impatient vivacity of his genius almost all the life writers we have had before toulon and des maisons are indeed strange insipid creatures and yet i had rather read the worst of them than be obliged to go through with this of milton's or the other's life of boileau where there is such a dull heavy succession of long quotations of uninteresting passages that it makes their method quite nauseous but the verbose tasteless frenchman seems to lay it down as a principle that every life must be a book and what is worse it seems a book without a life for what do we know of boileau after all his tedious stuff des maisons was much in the employ of the dutch booksellers then the great monopolizers in the literary mart of europe he supplied their nouvelle littraire from england but the worksheet price was very mean in those days i have seen annual accounts of des maisons settled to a line for four or five pounds and yet he sent the novelties as fresh as the post could carry them he held a confidential correspondence with these great dutch booksellers who consulted him in their distresses and he seems rather to have relieved them than himself but if he got only a few florins at rotterdam the same nouvelle littraire sometimes secured him valuable friends at london for in those days which perhaps are returning on us an english author would often appeal to a foreign journal for the commendation he might fail in obtaining at home and i have discovered in more cases than one that like other smuggled commodities the foreign article was often of home manufactory i give one of these curious bibliopolical distresses Soze, a bookseller at rotterdam who judged too critically for the repose of his authors seems to have been always fond of projecting a new journal tormented by the ideal excellence which he had conceived of such a work it vexed him that he could never find the workman once disappointed of the assistance he expected from a writer of talents he was fain to put up with one he was ashamed of but warily stipulated on very singular terms he confided this precious literary secret to des maisons i translate from his manuscript letter i send you my dear sir four sheets of the continuation of my journal and i hope this second part will turn out better than the former the author thinks himself a very able person but i must tell you frankly that he is a man without erudition and without any critical discrimination he writes pretty well and turns passably what he says but that is all m van effen having failed in his promises to realize my hopes on this occasion necessity compelled me to have recourse to him but for six months only and on condition that he should not on any account whatever allow any one to know that he is the author of the journal for his name alone would be sufficient to make even a passable book discreditable as you are among my friends i will confide to you in secrecy the name of this author it is m de limier footnote van effen was a dutch writer of some merit and one of a literary knot of ingenious men consisting of salangre saint hyacinthe prosper marchand etc who carried on a smart review for those days published at the hague under the title of journal littraire they all composed in french and van effen gave the first translations of our guardian robinson crusoe and the tale of a tub etc he did something more but not better he attempted to imitate the spectator in his le misanthrope seventeen twenty six which exhibits a picture of the uninteresting manners of a nation whom he could not make very lively de limier has had his name slipped into our biographical dictionaries an author cannot escape the fatality of the alphabet his numerous misdeeds are registered it is said that if he had not been so hungry he would have given proofs of possessing some talent End of footnote you see how much my interest is concerned that the author should not be known this anecdote is gratuitously presented to the editors of certain reviews as a serviceable hint to enter into the same engagement with some of their own writers for it is usually the de limier who expend their last puff in blowing their own name about the town
in england des maisons as a literary man made himself very useful to other men of letters and particularly to persons of rank and he found patronage and a pension like his talents very moderate a friend to literary men he lived amongst them from orator henley up to addison lord halifax and anthony collins i find a curious character of our des maisons in the handwriting of edward earl of oxford to whose father pope's earl of oxford and himself the nation owes the harleian treasures his lordship is a critic with high tory principles and high church notions this des maisons is a great man with those who are pleased to be called freethinkers particularly with mr anthony collins collects passages out of books for their writings his life of chillingworth is wrote to please that set of men the secret history i am to unfold relates to anthony collins and des maisons some curious book lovers will be interested in the personal history of an author they are well acquainted with yet which has hitherto remained unknown he tells his own story in a sort of epistolary petition he addressed to a noble friend characteristic of an author who cannot be deemed unpatronized yet whose name after all his painful labours might be inserted in my calamities of authors in this letter he announces his intention of publishing a dictionary like bayle having written the life of bayle the next step was to become himself a bayle so short is the passage of literary delusion he had published as a specimen the lives of hales and chillingworth he complains that his circumstances have not allowed him to forward that work nor digest the materials he had collected a work of that nature requires a steady application free from the cares and avocations incident to all persons obliged to seek for their maintenance i have had the misfortune to be in the case of those persons and am now reduced to a pension on the irish establishment which deducting the tax of four shillings in the pound and other charges brings me in about forty pounds a year of our english money Footnote i find that the nominal pension was three shillings sixpence per diem on the irish civil list which amounts to above sixty three pounds per annum if a pension be granted for reward it seems a mockery that the income should be so grievously reduced which cruel custom still prevails End of footnote this pension was granted to me in seventeen ten and i owe it chiefly to the friendship of mr addison who was then secretary to the earl of wharton lord lieutenant of ireland in seventeen eleven twelve and fourteen i was appointed one of the commissioners of the lottery by the interest of lord halifax and this is all i ever received from the government though i had some claim to the royal favour for in seventeen ten when the enemies to our constitution were contriving its ruin i wrote a pamphlet entitled lethe which was published in holland and afterwards translated into english and twice printed in london and being reprinted in dublin proved so offensive to the ministry in ireland that it was burnt by the hands of the hangman but so it is that after having showed on all occasions my zeal for the royal family and endeavoured to make myself serviceable to the public by several books published after forty years stay in england and in an advanced age i find myself and family destitute of a sufficient livelihood and suffering from complaints in the head and impaired sight by constant application to my studies i am confident my lord he adds that if the queen to whom i was made known on occasion of thuanus's french translation were acquainted with my present distress she would be pleased to afford me some relief Footnote. this letter or petition was written in seventeen thirty two in seventeen forty three he procured his pension to be placed on his wife's life and he died in seventeen forty five he was sworn in as gentleman of his majesty's privy chamber in seventeen twenty two sloan manuscripts forty two eighty nine among the confidential literary friends of des maisons he had the honour of ranking anthony collins a great lover of literature and a man of fine genius who in a continued correspondence with our des maisons treated him as his friend and employed him as his agent in his literary concerns 
these in the formation of an extensive library were in a state of perpetual activity and collins was such a true lover of his books that he drew up the catalogue with his own pen footnote there is a printed catalogue of his library End of footnote. anthony collins wrote several well-known works without prefixing his name but having pushed too far his curious inquiries on some obscure and polemical points he incurred the odium of a free thinker a term which then began to be in vogue and which the french adopted by translating it in their way a strong thinker or esprit fort whatever tendency to liberalize the mind from dogmas and creeds prevails in these works the talents and learning of collins were of the first class his morals were immaculate and his personal character independent but the odium theologicum of those days contrived every means to stab in the dark till the taste became hereditary with some i shall mention a fact of this cruel bigotry which occurred within my own observation on one of the most polished men of the age the late mr cumberland in the romance entitled his life gave this extraordinary fact that dr bentley who so ably replied by his remarks under the name of philolutherus lipsiensis to collins's discourse on free thinking when many years after he discovered him fallen into great distress conceiving that by having ruined collins's character as a writer for ever he had been the occasion of his personal misery he liberally contributed to his maintenance in vain i mentioned to that elegant writer who was not curious about facts that this person could never have been anthony collins who had always a plentiful fortune and when it was suggested to him that this a collins as he printed it must have been arthur collins the historical compiler who was often in pecuniary difficulties still he persisted in sending the lie down to posterity totidem virbus without alteration in his second edition observing to a friend of mine that the story while it told well might serve as a striking instance of his great relative's generosity and that it should stand because it could do no harm to any but to anthony collins whom he considered as little short of an atheist so much for this pious fraud but be it recollected that this anthony collins was the confidential friend of locke of whom locke said on his dying bed that collins was a man whom he valued in the first rank of those that he left behind him and the last words of collins on his own deathbed were that he was persuaded he was going to that place which god had designed for them that love him the cause of true religion will never be assisted by using such leaky vessels as cumberland's wilful calumnies which in the end must run out and be found like the present mere empty fictions an extraordinary circumstance occurred on the death of anthony collins he left behind him a considerable number of his own manuscripts there was one collection formed into eight octavo volumes and that they might be secured from the common fate of manuscripts he bequeathed them all and confided them to the care of our des maisons the choice of collins reflects honour on the character of des maisons yet he proved unworthy of it he suffered himself to betray his trust practised on by the earnest desire of the widow and perhaps by the arts of a mr tomlinson who appears to have been introduced into the family by the recommendation of dean sykes whom at length he supplanted and whom the widow to save her reputation was afterwards obliged to discard Footnote this information is from a note found among de Mezo's papers but its truth i have no means to ascertain End of footnote. in an unguarded moment he relinquished this precious legacy of the manuscripts and accepted fifty guineas as a present but if de Mezo lost his honour in this transaction he was at heart an honest man who had swerved for a single moment his conscience was soon awakened and he experienced the most violent compunctions it was in a paroxysm of this nature that he addressed the following letter to a mutual friend of the late anthony collins and himself january sixth seventeen thirty sir i am very glad to hear you are come to town and as you are my best friend now i have lost mr collins give me leave to open my heart to you and to beg your assistance in an affair which highly concerns both mr collins's your friend and my own honour and reputation the case in a few words stands thus 
mr collins by his last will and testament left me his manuscripts mr tomlinson who first acquainted me with it told me that mrs collins should be glad to have them and i made them over to her whereupon she was pleased to present me with fifty guineas i desired her at the same time to take care they should be kept safe and unhurt which she promised to do this was done the twenty fifth of last month mr tomlinson who managed all this affair was present now having further considered that matter i find that i have done a most wicked thing i am persuaded that i have betrayed the trust of a person who for twenty-six years had given me continual instances of his friendship and confidence i am convinced that i have acted contrary to the will and intention of my dear deceased friend showed a disregard to the particular mark of esteem he gave me on that occasion in short that i have forfeited what is dearer to me than my own life honour and reputation these melancholy thoughts have made so great an impression upon me that i protest to you i can enjoy no rest they haunt me everywhere day and night i earnestly beseech you sir to represent my unhappy case to mrs collins i acted with all the simplicity and uprightness of my heart i considered that the manuscripts would be as safe in mrs collins's hands as in mine that she was no less obliged to preserve them than myself and that as the library was left to her they might naturally go along with it besides i thought i could not too much comply with the desire of a lady to whom i have so many obligations but i see now clearly that this is not fulfilling mr collins's will and that the duties of our conscience are superior to all other regards but it is in her power to forgive and mend what i have done imprudently but with a good intention her high sense of virtue and generosity will not i am sure let her take any advantage of my weakness and the tender regard she has for the memory of the best of men and the tenderest of husbands will not suffer that his intention should be frustrated and that she should be the instrument of violating what is most sacred if our late friend had designed that his manuscript should remain in her hands he would certainly have left them to her by his last will and testament his acting otherwise is an evident proof that it was not his intention all this i propose to represent to her in the most respectful manner but you will do it infinitely better than i can in this present distraction of mind and i flatter myself that the mutual esteem and friendship which has continued so many years between mr collins and you will make you readily embrace whatever tends to honour his memory i send you the fifty guineas i received which i do now look upon as the wages of iniquity and i desire you to return them to mrs collins who as i hope it of her justice equity and regard to mr collins's intentions will be pleased to cancel my paper i am etc p de maiso the manuscripts were never returned to de maiso for seven years afterwards mrs collins who appears to have been a very spirited lady addressed to him the following letter on the subject of a report that she had permitted transcripts of these very manuscripts to get abroad this occasioned an animated correspondence from both sides march tenth seventeen thirty six to thirty seven sir i have thus long waited in expectation that you would ere this have called on dean sykes as sir b lucy said you intended that i might have had some satisfaction in relation to a very unjust reproach viz that i or somebody that i had trusted had betrayed some of the transcripts or manuscripts of mr collins into the bishop of london's hands i cannot therefore since you have not been with the dean as was desired but call on you in this manner to know what authority you had for such a reflection or on what grounds you went for saying that these transcripts are in the bishop of london's hands i am determined to trace out the grounds of such a report and you can be no friend of mine no friend of mr collins no friend to common justice if you refuse to acquaint me what foundation you had for such a charge i desire a very speedy answer to this who am sir your servant elizabeth collins to mr de maiso at his lodgings next door to the quaker's burying ground hanover street out of long acre to mrs collins march fourteenth seventeen thirty seven i had the honour of your letter of the tenth instant and as i find that something has been misapprehended i beg leave to set this matter right 
being lately with some honourable persons i told them it had been reported that some of mr c s manuscripts were fallen into the hands of strangers and that i should be glad to receive from you such information as might enable me to disprove that report what occasioned this surmise or what particular manuscripts were meant i was not able to discover so i was left to my own conjectures which upon a serious consideration induced me to believe that it might relate to the manuscripts in eight volumes in octavo of which there is a transcript but as the original and the transcript are in your possession if you please madam to compare them together you may easily see whether they be both entire and perfect or whether there be anything wanting in either of them by this means you will assure yourself and satisfy your friends that several important pieces are safe in your hands and that the report is false and groundless all this i take the liberty to offer out of the singular respect i always profess for you and for the memory of mr collins to whom i have endeavoured to do justice on all occasions and particularly in the memoirs that have been made use of in the general dictionary and i hope my tender concern for his reputation will further appear when i publish his life april sixth seventeen thirty seven sir my ill state of health has hindered me from acknowledging sooner the receipt of yours from which i hoped for some satisfaction in relation to your charge in which i cannot but think myself very deeply concerned you tell me now that you was left to your own conjectures what particular manuscripts were reported to have fallen into the hands of strangers and that upon a serious consideration you was induced to believe that it might relate to the manuscripts in eight volumes octavo of which there was a transcript i must beg of you to satisfy me very explicitly who were the persons that reported this to you and from whom did you receive this information you know that mr collins left several manuscripts behind him what grounds had you for your conjecture that it related to the manuscripts in eight volumes rather than to any other manuscripts of which there was a transcript i beg that you will be very plain and tell me what strangers were named to you and why you said the bishop of london if your informer said stranger to you i am so much concerned in this that i must repeat it if you have the singular respect for mr collins which you profess that you would help me to trace out this reproach which is so abusive to sir your servant elizabeth collins to mrs collins i flattered myself that my last letter would have satisfied you but i have the mortification to see that my hopes were vain therefore i beg leave once more to set this matter right when i told you what had been reported i acted as i thought the part of a true friend by acquainting you that some of your manuscripts had been purloined in order that you might examine a fact which to me appeared of the last consequence and i verily believe that everybody in my case would have expected thanks for such a friendly information but instead of that i find myself represented as an enemy and challenged to produce proofs and witnesses of a thing dropped in conversation a hearsay as if in those cases people kept a register of what they hear and entered the names of the persons who spoke the time place etc and had with them persons ready to witness the whole etc i did own i never thought of such a thing and whenever i happened to hear that some of my friends had some loss i thought it my duty to acquaint them with such report that they might inquire into the matter and see whether there was any ground for it but i never troubled myself with the names of the persons who spoke as being a thing entirely needless and unprofitable give me leave further to observe that you are in no ways concerned in the matter as you seem to be apprehensive you are suppose some manuscripts have been taken out of your library who will say you ought to bear the guilt of it what man in his senses who has the honour to know you will say you gave your consent to such thing that you was privy to it how can you then take upon yourself an action to which you was neither privy and consenting do not such things happen every day and do the losers think themselves injured or abused when they are talked of is it impossible to be betrayed by a person we confided in you call what i told you was a report a surmise you call it i say an information and speak of informers as if there was a plot laid wherein i received the information i thought i had the honour to be better known to you mr collins loved me and esteemed me for my integrity and sincerity of which he had several proofs how i have been drawn in to injure him to forfeit the good opinion he had of me and which were he now alive would deservedly expose me to his utmost contempt is a grief which i shall carry to the grave 
it would be a sort of comfort to me if those who have consented i should be drawn in were in some measure sensible of the guilt towards so good kind and generous a man thus we find that seven years after day maizot had inconsiderately betrayed his sacred trust his remorse was still awake and the sincerity of his grief is attested by the affecting style which describes it the spirit of his departed friend seemed to be hovering about him and in his imagination would haunt him to the grave the nature of these manuscripts the cause of the earnest desire of retaining them by the widow the evident unfriendliness of her conduct to des maizeaux and whether these manuscripts consisting of eight octavo volumes with their transcripts were destroyed or are still existing are all circumstances which my researches have hitherto not ascertained End of section three Section four of Curiosities of Literature, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume Three by Isaac Disraeli. History of New Words neology or the novelty of words and phrases is an innovation which with the opulence of our present language the english philologer is most jealous to allow but we have puritans or precisions of english superstitiously nice the fantastic coinage of affectation or caprice will cease to circulate from its own alloy but shall we reject the ore of fine workmanship and solid weight there is no government mint of words and it is no statutable offence to invent a felicitous or daring expression unauthorised by mr todd when a man of genius in the heat of his pursuits or his feelings has thrown out a peculiar word it probably conveyed more precision or energy than any other established word otherwise he is but an ignorant pretender julius caesar who unlike other great captains is authority on words as well as about blows wrote a large treatise on analogy in which that fine genius counselled to avoid every unusual word as a rock the cautious quintilian as might be expected opposes all innovation in language if the new word is well received small is the glory if rejected it raises laughter this only marks the penury of his feelings in this species of adventure the great legislator of words who lived when his own language was at its acme seems undecided yet pleaded for this liberty shall that which the romans allowed to cecilius and to plautus be refused to virgil and varius the answer to the question might not be favourable to the inquirer while a language is forming writers are applauded for extending its limits when established for restricting themselves to them but this is to imagine that a perfect language can exist the good sense and observation of horace perceive that there may be occasions where necessity must become the mother of invented words si forte necessi est indicius monstrare recentibus abdita rerum if you write of things abstruse or new some of your own inventing may be used so it be seldom and discreetly done roscommon but horace's canon for deciding on the legality of the new invention or the standard by which it is to be tried will not serve to assist the inventor of words le suit semperque lisibit signatum praesente nota prosudere numum footnote this verse was corrected by bentley prosudere numum instead of produceri nomen which the critics agree is one of his happy conjectures End of footnote. this 
Prysen's nota or public stamp can never be affixed to any new coinage of words for many received at a season have perished with it footnote henry cockerham's curious little english dictionary or an interpretation of hard english words duodecimo sixteen thirty one professes to give in its first book the choicest words themselves now in use wherewith our language is enriched and become so copious many have not survived such as the following acrological and improper speech adapted driven in by force blandiloquy flattering speech compaginate to set together that which is broken concessation loitering delitigate to scold or chide vehemently depalmate to give one a box on the ear essuriate to hunger strenuity activity curiously enough this author notes some words as those now out of use and only used of some ancient writers but which we now commonly use such are the following abandon to forsake or cast off abate to make less diminish or take from End of footnote. the privilege of stamping words is reserved for their greatest enemy time itself and the inventor of a new word must never flatter himself that he has secured the public adoption for he must lie in his grave before he can enter the dictionary in will's address to the reader prefixed to the collection of voyages published in fifteen seventy seven he finds fault with eden's translation from peter martyr for using words that smelt too much of the latin we should scarcely have expected to find among them ponderous portentous despicable obsequious homicide imbibed destructive prodigious the only words he quotes not thoroughly naturalized are dominators ditionaries subjects solicitude careful the tatler number thirty introduces several polis syllables introduced by military narrations which he says if they attack us too frequently we shall certainly put them to flight and cut off the rear every one of them still keep their ground half the french words used affectedly by melantha in dryden's mariage a la mode as innovations in our language are now in common use naivete foible chagrin grimace embarrass double entendre equivoque eclaircissement ridicule all these words which she learns by heart to use occasionally are now in common use a dr russell calls psalm singers ballad singers having found the song of solomon in an old translation the ballad of ballads for which he is reproached by his antagonist for not knowing that the signification of words alters with time should i call him knave he ought not to be concerned at it for the apostle paul is also called a knave of jesus christ footnote a most striking instance of the change of meaning in a word is in the old law term let without let or hindrance meaning void of all opposition hence i will let you meant i will hinder you and not as we should now think i will give you free leave End of footnote. unquestionably neology opens a wide door to innovation scarcely has a century passed since our language was patched up with gallic idioms as in the preceding century it was piebald with spanish and with italian and even with dutch the political intercourse of islanders with their neighbours has ever influenced their language in elizabeth's reign italian phrases footnote, shakespeare makes ancient pistol use a new coined italian word when he speaks of being better accommodated to the great delight of justice shallow who exclaims it comes from accomodo a good phrase and ben jonson in his tale of a tub ridicules inigo jones's love of two words he often used if it conduce to the design what e'er is feasible i can express End of footnote and netherland words were imported 
in james and charles the spanish framed the style of courtesy in charles the second the nation and the language were equally frenchified yet such are the sources from whence we have often derived some of the wealth of our language there are three foul corruptors of a language caprice affectation and ignorance such fashionable cant terms as theatricals and musicals invented by the flippant topham still survive among his confraternity of frivolity a lady eminent for the elegance of her taste and of whom one of the best judges the celebrated miss edgeworth observed to me that she spoke the purest and most idiomatic english she had ever heard threw out an observation which might be extended to a great deal of our present fashionable vocabulary she is now old enough she said to have lived to hear the vulgarisms of her youth adopted in drawing-room circles Footnote. the term pluck once only known to the prize ring has now got into use in general conversation and also into literature as a term indicative of ready courage End of footnote. to lunch now so familiar from the fairest lips in her youth was only known in the servants hall an expression very rife of late among our young ladies a nice man whatever it may mean whether that the man resemble a pudding or something more nice conveys the offensive notion that they are ready to eat him up when i was a boy it was an age of bon temps this good tone mysteriously conveyed a sublime idea of fashion the term imported late in the eighteenth century closed with it twaddle for a while succeeded bore but bore has recovered the supremacy we want another swift to give a new edition of his polite conversation a dictionary of barbarisms too might be collected from some wretched neologists whose pens are now at work lord chesterfield in his exhortations to conform to johnson's dictionary was desirous however that the great lexicographer should add as an appendix a neological dictionary containing those polite though perhaps not strictly grammatical words and phrases commonly used and sometimes understood by the beau monde footnote such terms as patent to the public normal condition crass behaviour are the inventions of the last few years End of footnote this last phrase was doubtless a contribution such a dictionary had already appeared in the french language drawn up by two caustic critics who in the dictionnaire néologique à l'usage des beaux esprits du siècle collected together the numerous unlucky inventions of affectation with their modern authorities a collection of the fine words and phrases called from some very modern poetry might show the real amount of the favours bestowed on us the attempts of neologists are however not necessarily to be condemned and we may join with the commentators of aulus gellius who have lamented the loss of a chapter of which the title only has descended to us that chapter would have demonstrated what happens to all languages that some neologisms which at first are considered forced or inelegant become sanctioned by use and in time are quoted as authority in the very language which in their early stage they were imagined to have debased the true history of men's minds is found in their actions their wants are indicated by their contrivances and certain it is that in highly cultivated ages we discover the most refined intellects attempting neologisms footnote shakespeare has a powerfully composed line in the speech of the duke of burgundy henry v act five scene two when describing the fields overgrown with weeds he exclaims the coulter rusts that should deracinate such savagery End of footnote. it would be a subject of great curiosity to trace the origin of many happy expressions when and by whom created plato substituted the term providence for fate and a new system of human affairs arose from a single word 
cicero invented several to this philosopher we owe the term of moral philosophy which before his time was called the philosophy of manners but on this subject we are perhaps more interested by the modern than by the ancient languages richardson the painter of the human heart has coined some expressions to indicate its little secret movements which are admirable that great genius merited a higher education and more literary leisure than the life of a printer could afford montaigne created some bold expressions many of which have not survived him his incuriosite so opposite to curiosity well describes that state of negligence where we will not learn that of which we are ignorant with us the word incurious was described by halen sixteen fifty six as an unusual word it has been appropriately adopted by our best writers although we still want incuriosity charron invented étrangeté unsuccessfully but which says a french critic would be the true substantive of the word étrange our lock is the solitary instance produced for foreignness for remoteness or want of relation to something malheur barred from the latin insidieux securite which have been received but a bolder word de vouloir by which he proposed to express cesser de vouloir has not a term however expressive and precise cornier happily introduced un vin sou in a verse in the cid vous êtes un vin sou mais non pas invincible yet this created word by their great poet has not sanctioned this fine distinction among the french for we are told that it is almost a solitary instance balzac was a great inventor of neologisms urbanite and felicite were struck in his mint si le mont felicite non pas français il le sera l'année qui vient so confidently proud was the neologist and it prospered as well as urbanite of which he says quand l'usage aura mûri parmi nous en mot de si mauvais goût et corrigé la mertume de la novauté qui s'y peut trouver nous nous y accoutumerons comme mot autre que nous avons emprunté de la même langue balzac was however too sanguine in some other words for his delecte his seriosite etc still retained their bitterness of novelty menage invented a term of which an equivalent is wanting in our language j'ai fait prosatur a limitation de l'italien prosatore pour dire un homme qui écrit en prose to distinguish a prose from a verse writer we once had a proser drayton uses it but this useful distinction has unluckily degenerated and the current sense is so daily urgent that the purer sense is irrecoverable when d'aboncourt was translating lucian he invented in french the words indolence and indolent to describe a momentary languor rather than that habitual indolence in which sense they are now accepted and in translating tacitus he created the word turboulement but it did not prosper any more than that of temporisement segre invented the word impardonnable which after having been rejected was revived and is equivalent to our expressive unpardonable moliere ridicules some neologisms of the précieuses of his day but we are too apt to ridicule that which is new and which we often adopt when it becomes old moliere laughed at the term sans canaille to describe one who assumed the manners of a blackguard the expressive word has remained in the language the meaning is disputed as well as the origin is lost of some novel terms this has happened to a word in daily use fudge it is a cant term not in gross and only traced by todd not higher than to goldsmith 
it is however no invention of his in a pamphlet entitled remarks upon the navy seventeen hundred the term is declared to have been the name of a certain nautical personage who had lived in the lifetime of the writer there was sir in our time one captain fudge commander of a merchantman who upon his return from a voyage how ill fraught soever his ship was always brought home his owners a good cargo of lies so much that now aboard ship the sailors when they hear a great lie told cry out you fudge it it is singular that such an obscure byword among sailors should have become one of the most popular in our familiar style and not less that recently at the bar in a court of law its precise meaning perplexed plaintiff and defendant and their counsel i think it does not signify mere lies but bouncing lies or rhodomontades there are two remarkable french words created by the abbe de st pierre who passed his meritorious life in the contemplation of political morality and universal benevolence bienfaisance and gloriole he invented gloriole as a contemptuous diminutive of glory to describe that vanity of some egotists so proud of the small talents which they may have received from nature or from accident beyond faisance first appeared in this sentence l'esprit de la vraie religion est le principal but de l'évangile c'est la bienfaisance c'est-à-dire la pratique de la charité envers le prochain this word was so new that in the moment of its creation this good man explained its necessity and origin complaining that the word charity is abused by all sorts of christians in the persecution of their enemies and even heretics affirm that they are practising christian charity in persecuting other heretics i have sought for a term which might convey to us a precise idea of doing good to our neighbours and i can form none more proper to make myself understood than the term of bienfaisance good doing let those who like use it i would only be understood and it is not equivocal the happy word was at first criticised but at length every kind heart found it responded to its own feeling some verses from voltaire alluding to the political reveries of the good abbe notice the critical opposition yet the new word answered to the great rule of horace certain la tour dans la plume féconde fitant des vieilles projets pour le bien du monde et qui depuis trente ans écrit pour des ingrats vient de créer un mot qui manque à vos là ce mot est bienfaisance il me plaît il rassemble si le cœur en est cru bien des vertus ensemble petit grammairien grand percepteur de sort qui pèsait la parole et mesurait les mots par expression vous semble hasardé mais l'univers entier doit en chérir l'idée the french revolutionists in their rage for innovation almost barbarized the pure french of augustan age of their literature as they did many things which never before occurred and sometimes experienced feelings as transitory as they were strange their nomenclature was copious but the revolutionary jargon often shows the danger and the necessity of neologisms they form an appendix to the academy dictionary our plain english has served to enrich this odd mixture of philology and politics club clubiste comite jour juge de pays blend with their terrorisme long terne a verb active leve en masse norad and the other verb active septon brise etc the barbarous term demoralization is said to have been the invention of the horrid capuchin chabot and the remarkable expression of arriere pensee belonged exclusively in its birth to the jesuitic astuteness of the abbe c a that political actor who in changing sides never required prompting in his new part 
a new word the result of much consideration with its author or a term which though unknown to the language conveys a collective assemblage of ideas by a fortunate designation is a precious contribution of genius new words should convey new ideas swift living amidst a civil war of pamphlets when certain writers were regularly employed by one party to draw upon replies to the other created a term not to be found in our dictionaries but which by a single stroke characterizes these hirelings he called them answer jobbers we have not dropped the fortunate expression from any want of its use but of perception in our lexicographers the celebrated marquis of lansdowne introduced a useful word which has of late been warmly adopted in france as well as in england to liberalize the noun has been drawn out of the verb for in the marquis's time that was only an abstract conception which is now a sect and to liberalize was theoretically introduced before the liberals arose Footnote the quarterly review recently marked the word liberalize in italics as a strange word undoubtedly not aware of its origin it has been lately used by mr dugald stewart to liberalize the views dissertation second part page one hundred and thirty eight end of footnote it is curious to observe that as an adjective it had formerly in our language a very opposite meaning to its recent one it was synonymous with libertine or licentious we have a liberal villain and a most profane and liberal counsellor we find one declaring i have spoken too liberally this is unlucky for the liberals who will not give allowance to our liberal jests upon their persons beaumont and fletcher dr priestley employed a forcible but not an elegant term to mark the general information which had begun in his day this he frequently calls the spread of knowledge burke attempted to brand with a new name that set of pert petulant sophistical sciolists whose philosophy the french since their revolutionary period have distinguished as philosophism and the philosophers themselves as philosophists he would have designated them as literators but few exotic words will circulate new words must be the coinage of our own language to blend with the vernacular idiom many new words are still wanted we have no word by which we could translate the otium of the latins the dilettante of the italians the alembique of the french as an epithet to describe that sublimated ingenuity which exhausts the mind till like the fusion of the diamond the intellect itself disappears a philosopher in an extensive view of a subject in all its bearings may convey to us the result of his last considerations by the coinage of a novel and significant expression as this of professor dugald stewart political religionism let me claim the honour of one pure neologism i ventured to introduce the term of fatherland to describe our natal solum i have lived to see it adopted by lord byron and by mr southey and the word is now common a lady has even composed both the words and the air of a song on fatherland this energetic expression may therefore be considered as authenticated and patriotism may stamp it with its glory and its affection fatherland is congenial with the language in which we find that other fine expression mother tongue the patriotic neologism originated with me in holland when in early life it was my daily pursuit to turn over the glorious history of its independence under the title of vanderlandsche history the history of fatherland if we acknowledge that the creation of some neologisms may sometimes produce the beautiful the revival of the dead is the more authentic miracle for a new word must long remain doubtful but an ancient word happily 
recovered rests on a basis of permanent strength it has both novelty and authority a collection of picturesque words found among our ancient writers would constitute a precious supplement to the history of our language far more expressive than our term of executioner is their solemn one of the deathsman than our vagabond their scatterling than our idiot or lunatic their moonling a word which mr gifford observes should not have been suffered to grow obsolete herrick finally describes by the term pittering the peculiar shrill and short cry of the grasshopper the cry of the grasshopper is pit 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 quickly repeated envy dusking the lustre of genius is a verb lost for us but which gives a more precise expression to the feeling than any other words which we could use the late dr boucher in the prospectus of his proposed dictionary did me the honour then a young writer to quote an opinion i had formed early in life of the purest source of neology which is in the revival of old words words that wise bacon or brave raleigh spake we have lost many exquisite and picturesque expressions through the dullness of our lexicographers or by the deficiency in that profounder study of our writers which their labours require far more than they themselves know the natural graces of our language have been impoverished the genius that throws its prophetic eye over the language and the taste that must come from heaven no lexicographer imagines are required to accompany him amidst a library of old books End of section four